Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Charter Township of Grand Blank Board of Trustees meeting for Tuesday, January 11th. If we could all rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Rick Robertson would care to call the roll. I would be happy to call the roll, Mr. Supervisor. <coughs> uh, Trustee Hugo. Here. Uh, Trustee Fike. Here. Trustee Raritan. Here. Trustee White. Here. Uh, Treasurer Kilmer is absent. Myself, of course, I'm here. Supervisor Bennett. Yes. Okay, six members present, a quorum. Okay, very good. At this time, I would seek approval of the agenda. There's a motion by Trustee Fike, supported by Trustee Raritan. Motion by Fike, supported by Raritan, to uh, approve the agenda. Uh, Trustee Raritan. Yes. Uh, Trustee Hugo. Yes. Trustee White. Yes. Trustee Fike. Yes. Uh, myself, of course, yes. Uh, Supervisor Bennett. Yes. Uh, six, six nothing, motion passes. Okay, very good. At this time, uh, we'll open it for public comment. And seeing no public comment, uh, we'll bring it back here to the board. And we will move on to approval of the consent agenda. So moved. Okay, motion by Trustee Reardon, supported by Trustee Fike. Or the consent agenda. Correct. Okay, uh, Trustee Fike. Yes. Uh, Trustee White. Yes. Trustee Hugo. Yes. Trustee Raritan. Yes. Uh, myself, yes. Supervisor Bennett. Yes. Six nothing, motion passes. Thank you. Uh, number six on our agenda, old business, is our strategic plan recap for 2021, and Mr. Lima to take it away. Thank you, Mr. Supervisor. Um, at your uh, Dias locations, you will find a copy of the strategic plan for 2021 through 2024. Um, everything in the uh, first um, few pages is, is just like it was, but I thought bringing out a fresh copy, uh, open for discussion, because what we agreed to do a year ago after we had met and started this process and then came up and worked through it, was that we would look at it in January for a complete review and just have a conversation uh, about whether we still believe that we uh, got it right as far as what our main strategic objectives are. And uh, so we included the entire packet because it's just as a refresher of the things we went through. And again, major goal areas of uh, infrastructure and community vitality and community connective, connectiveness, easy for me to say, and identity. So those were the kind of the major uh, broad reaching goals that we selected or that the board selected for uh, work on. And um, when we uh, started this process, we developed the grid uh, based upon our SWOT analysis and then what the board direction was on those goals. And I've included the, the grid sheets in here and. The board's been updated every two weeks on one or two of the items. Uh, I thought it would be a good start for maybe the board just to review as you go through those grids. Um, we try to get the most updated copies in here. Uh, we're trying to save them into the O drive so that all of the staff when they work on it can save them in the same location so that whenever we go to the grid to pull it to share with the board that they're always the updated copies of these. Um, we have our, our uh, strategic initiatives in there, and you'll see you know, some of the updating. If we go through, you know, like the branding, for example, develop logo and the community branding. Well, we do have the new logo. In fact, I'm sporting it today, um, and it's one of those things that, you know, that it, we tried to give it so that it has that look of a community in motion. It, the, the logo gives it that motion. This is the logo that you're seeing on your agenda packets and the things that we're talking about putting on the wayfinding signs into Grand Blank Township. Um, hats off to Executive Coordinator Melissa Roberts who really headed this project up, worked with the committee, uh, the branding committee, thank the board members that are on the branding committee for their work and, and <clears throat> what we kind of came up with. 
Uh, this is the board's opportunity to take a look and see if we're on track, off track. Uh, are we doing the right thing? Are we hitting the, what you had envisioned? Um, and when you look down that grid, uh, you know, the logo thing, we, we've got that, the tagline we worked through. Uh, the street signs, um, we're not there yet. We have uh, all of the locations and we're designing the signs. Uh, believing that that's going to be sometime in early 2022 that uh, we'll, we'll order those and get the price and order those and move that forward uh, and get all of those. You guys know as you drive through the community, you know, welcome to Grand Blank Township. We're leaving Grand Blank Township. We want to be consistent everywhere where we've got our logo and that branded image and so that you really know when you come in. Um, I still think that one of the areas that we can work on, in addition to those smaller, you know, metal signs that, that tag you no matter what in, east, north, south, east, west you come in, but we talked about before, the, a really nice, you know, you're coming in from the north side, up on that corner, you know, somewhere, welcome to Grand Blank Township. Whether we incorporate the logo, we still have to talk about the sign out front here for the government center. It's old, faded, it's probably sending not the image that we want as far as from a rebranding thing. So. We've got work to do, um, but you know we love the feedback from the board. Are we on track? Are we heading in the right direction? Um, are we missing something? Is there other directions that you have for us as a staff? I think one of the things that uh, also helps the rebranding is the uh, upgrade on the newsletter that we sent out. Um, the uh, look of it was uh, much more up to date and uh, more in line with the branding that we want for the township. I'd like to see if we can even do more in terms of uh, more frequently or um, expand on a little bit more with some photos and some things of that nature. But I think the color was great uh, rather than just having it in black and white. And I think that goes a long way for helping to brand the township. So great job to uh, Ms. Roberts for that as well. Um, the signage, I think you're right, Dennis. I, in terms of the wayfinding that I'm looking forward to getting those up there eventually, but I know we want to make sure that, you know, that it's visible at 45 miles an hour, or if there's no police around 60 miles an hour, um, that people are going to be able to read the sign. And so I know we're making sure that the font and whatever is readable, but in addition to that, you know, at some of the prime entrances to the township, whether it's South Saginaw street at, 75 or even the ones at Hill Road and uh, and Fatten Road, which is probably one of the busiest intersections in the, in the county. Um, we have some welcome signs there, but they're not very visible. I think we need to upgrade those so that they're, they're more visible, whether it's lighting them or what have you, making them a little bit larger. Uh, but I think we've made a lot of good progress on, on branding, but as the plan shows, we've got a lot more that we want to try and accomplish. The website, too, I don't know if everybody's been on it, but it went live sometime in the last week, I think. I don't know, today. I, today? Okay. Um, I was on it today, and I was like, when did this happen? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I knew it was in the last few days, but the website today is, uh, is live. So for our public, uh, you'll have to take a look at our new website, and I'm sure we'll take any input from the public as well as our board and staff. But uh, I know Ms. Roberts put in a considerable amount of time uh, meeting with all the departments to make sure that things were uh, easily found by public, and hopefully w that will prove itself as people use it. But I found it to be very uh, organized and very uh, colorful and branding the township in the manner that we want to. Anything else on the branding, Mr. Fike? Well, I just have a question about number three here. <clears throat> um, on which page is that? Uh, very I, first branding for GBT on that first grid, the first grid. Okay, page right. All right. Um, so there is, at least in talk, a plan to put a sign on I-75. Is that accurate? And has it been chosen which uh, entrance? Or well, there, there's, How we, do we have quite that? a few, so I mean... Uh, <clears throat> What are we thinking about in that regard? I wonder where we're going on that. So, I, you know, one of the things Scott is really good at, um, Supervisor Ben is really good at bringing to our attention is the places who get it right, like Auburn Hills, for example, um, Vienna Township, mm -hmm. uh, where you see their off-ramps where they really grab your attention and say, hey, we're here. And, yeah. and 
and you come through Grand Blanc Township, and we don't have that uh, anywhere, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. So which one would have the most impact? Um, you know, we're, our goal is to work with MDOT on where we could possibly do this. One of the areas that we started to explore was if we can really keep uh, one of those areas really mowed down and nice, can we work with a garden organization to maybe, if we put it in there and put a sign in there, can we do some plannings and get some assistance? Because we, it's not one of those things where we can do it once, put up a sign and mow it and say like nailed it, you know, check the box and go. This is ongoing. It means we're going to have to at least have the maintenance costs, make sure that we have our mowing out there, make sure that we take care of any plantings. Um, but it, we're wide open at this point. And really, for the board's perspective, when you drive through or you're coming into Grand Blanc Township, which which one would have the most impact from from your standpoint that would say, mm -hmm. maybe there's one on each end? I mean, I, you know, is it Holly Road? Yeah. Is it when you... Uh, well, in talking with uh, Vienna Township, uh, their one exit, it costs them between sixty and $70,000 a year to maintain it to the level that they have it, uh, whether it's planting grass seed, mowing, um, whatever else they do there as far as the landscape goes. I know they plant a lot of flowers in the spring. looks gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, with us having, I believe, uh, if you look at the Hill Road on 475, the door exit now off 75, the Holly Road exit on 75, and then also South Saginaw Street. What is that for? Four, Four uh, interchanges. Um, we need to somehow come up with which one um, is our priority. The other <clears throat> thing I mentioned at one of our previous board meetings was the DDA also uh, plans to uh, work uh, in conjunction with us with lighting in some of those areas and, you know, um, at least the Dort to uh, going down Baldwin Road from Dort to Ruby Drive, lighting that area and maybe Holly Road as well. My guess is that probably the, the Holly Road interchange gets the most use, at least right now. We'll see how the Dort Highway exit, but I don't think it's going to rival the, the Holly Road immediately. Um, it, it, one area of opportunity is the DDA, obviously. We have it in the grid about, the, you know, explore whether the DDA can pay for it. Um, typically, you say the DDA can pay for anything that's within their boundaries, but DDA can also pay, even if that Holly Road interchange isn't completely in the boundaries, it's kind of the entrance, it's the front porch to the DDA, David, wouldn't you yep, agree? I agree. So uh, there, there is that, and again, I don't want to tap the DDA too much. They have... Uh, they're very aggressive in where they want to go, but we <laughs> we also have to have the money coming in before we go wild. But I mean, it, it, I think that would be a very good partnership where the DDA puts into their annual budget that, hey, if you guys are going to construct this initially as a township, then we'll agree to the mowing contract comes to the DDA and we'll provide the flowers every year for the gardening club. Yeah. Um, and, and then they can put their signage up there with the DDA logo or whatever. Yeah, you know, the DDA has taken on or plans to take on quite a bit of uh, uh, quite a few projects, put it that way, that, and it's going to be at considerable cost, and they'll be coming to our board with a few of those requests. But um. So what's the next step as far as what we meet with uh, MDOT and say, what do you think? So you know, DPS Director Sears will um, head up that portion of it to work with MDOT to say if we've selected Holly Road and then we take a look at it and start the process of uh, where are, what are we allowed to do, where can we place the signage. Um, they've obviously got uh, very strict rules about where we're going to go, but um, we can start that if, if Holly Road sounds like where the board wants to go. We'll put that into the grid. We can always change, but let's explore with Holly Road and see if we can't put something mm -hmm. both North and south. Yeah, yeah. you're coming through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's look at it. Um, that would be very cool and, and long overdue to give us a little mm -hmm. signature entrance and exit. Yeah. It'd be interesting to know how many cars uh, pass by that intersection on 75, but it's got to be. Yeah. I mean, the traffic um, count for that area has to be immense and in terms of our visibility to everybody passing by, it would only enhance that. We could apply for grants for that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Okay, anything else on 
community connectiveness and identity and branding. We are working on a video for uh, the DDA, but it will definitely help the brand for Grand Blank and we have that completed. Yeah, I think it'd be a great one to show to the board and you know maybe they can wrap it up in the next meeting. They're gonna shoot another couple of, uh, reshoot um, a couple of portions on Thursday. <laughs> Supervisor Bennett, so make sure you're here. <laughs> the camera ready. <laughs> Scott and I had to, this will be our third uh, time that we're shooting our portions of it, but um, we're, we're going to need a little makeup. <laughs> <laughs> we're not as photogenic as we thought we were. We, we need some help. I was going to do it like behind it, like an anonymous guy behind a screen, but. We'll get it right. So the, the next one. The Saginaw Street. Uh, corridor improvements, as you guys know, we we did that review. I won't go through all of it, but you guys know you had a copy of it, went through it. We realized that there were some things that were a little bit too aggressive for us to follow, but there's some things that weren't in there that we wanted to explore, um, you know, including that revolving loan fund, uh, you know, establishing a legal framework for that. All of those things are in gear. We met with the uh, North End business owners group. Uh, we did uh, fall down, and, and I'll give us a, a D for that when we met, and we, we got the momentum going, and then we didn't do the follow-up with them yet on a follow-up meeting and a um, mail-out to, to help us prioritize what their ideas were that they wanted to accomplish. So that one we didn't, we, we fell down a little bit on that. We've got to get that fired back up on the grid and, and take a look at that. Um, is, that, is that, with your, to you, Mr. Supervisor, is that the survey we talked about earlier? Correct. Yes. Yep. We, okay, so that's is that in process of being worked on? What we have right now is we have a list of the items that need to be prioritized, right? So the survey's got to go. We just haven't gotten the survey out. We started to try to cram it out at the end of the year and then made the conscious decision to wait till after the first year because we just we don't want to pay short uh, shrift to it either. We want to make sure that we're okay. Yeah, um, that we do. I think it's we best we right. waited till after the first of the year just with everything everybody has is going on. Um, but I think that's really critically important, and it's one of the things that we heard uh, since I've been here, quite frankly, is, you know, we talked a lot about maybe South End development, forming the DDA, and and what are we going to do about the North End. So I, I, I don't want to lose sight of that. I think that we have a tremendous opportunity here. Um, we also discussed forming, uh, you know, a um, community improvement authority. Uh, that's not an issue. Again, um, what we would report back to the board is that, it will take a while for that thing to be funded. So I mean, it, it's it, it because the values tend to to drop here, not because there's not a lot of new development coming in. Um, it could be 10 years before we have any money in there. The easier thing would be the revolving loan fund, uh, and again, that will be the board has to set the parameters of like how much money would you like to put in there, how much would you be willing. I've looked at a few other ones. So, um, I can tell you that from my research, it would appear that. A lot of places will do it. It's kind of a matching, like you're going to put in five thousand, we'll give you five thousand. You're putting seventy five hundred, we'll match your seventy five hundred, but it caps at ten thousand. Uh, it's got a relatively short time frame to pay back. You know, maybe three years at a low interest rate, two percent, three percent. The idea being that you're giving somebody that hand up that just doesn't, they can't. You know, maybe they don't feel like they qualify for regular finance. You know, they just don't want to have to go to the bank for additional financing and be able to approach uh, mm -hmm. the town <laughs> to do that. I still think it's a great idea, and, and we can roll it out as small or as big. We could you know, start with a smaller amount and see if there's any uptake on it. Um, but I think it's more important to see how the business owners respond back to that survey on whether they believe that. Um, where, where is that on the priority list? Is lighting more important? Is uh, sidewalks or pathways more important than that facade improvement. The facade improvement I like because it's a quicker, like you can see it right now. Yeah. Uh, the other things are going to take a few years of planning, going after grants, setting aside some seed money, uh, matching funds uh, to try to, to improve that. Or uh, creating, well, we asked about them when we had them here, how they felt about us creating a special assessment district and assessing all of the property owners that would be impacted. You'll get questions like, well, if the sidewalk's only on that side of the street, then why am I paying? How does that impact me? And if you're gonna run sidewalks on both sides of the street, 
um, you need some money. Uh, and, and then it becomes a little bit more challenging. Uh, David could probably speak to if we ran the path or sidewalk down on one side of the street, what's the likelihood that we're going to get challenged from or to have challenges from someone who's on the other side who says they don't derive any taxable value, any benefit from it? Yeah, and that's the problem. And, and when you get to the tax tribunal on a question like that in an assessment, uh, the, the tribunal standard is, is very difficult to meet under any circumstance. And, and really it is a matter of trying to argue that that the value of the property um, that you included in the assessment district um, gets the, the same proportional um, increase in value as the project. So if the sidewalk costs $10,000, then a prop we would have to show that a property benefited $10,000. We can spread that out, of course. So the farther away you get from the physical location of a property, the harder it is to make that argument. Um, I think we could, you know, when we talk about it as a district, though, um, or, or as a as a corridor, I think we're we're on better footing to do that if we can show that there's some sort of uh, beneficial pedestrian traffic that benefits everyone. So it, it's not it isn't uh, uh, something that can't be done. It'll just take some creativity. Would it make more sense for us to have the discussion about forming a corridor improvement authority first before we started to have the question about special assessment districts? I, I think that, and I was, as you were explaining the, the options to these, uh, to, to the property owners, one of the things that we always get with special assessments is people say, well, how much will it cost and what are my options? And so maybe it is probably a good idea to, to, to lay out the, just really the thumbnail differences between, um, you know, a TIF uh, uh, generated uh, improvement plan versus revolving fund versus special assessment. And I'm, I'm happy to actually kick that off. I mean, that's something I can get together very quickly. Just okay. to give property owners a, a real world understanding of, of what their benefit will be and what the cost will be. I think there could be some potential redevelopment uh, in the future along Saginaw Street here just with uh, some of the conversations I've had with some business owners that I think some of these properties may change hands in the next several years for other, turn into other purposes other than what maybe they exist as now. And people want to locate their business in Grand Blank. And uh, I don't know, I, I just think that uh, there might be some opportunity to capture some things maybe in the future. So I think <clears throat> it's wise that we look at all our options. So again, that's kind of where we're at on the Saginaw Street corridor um, goal area. Uh, are we getting it right? Are we heading in the right direction? Does the board have any concerns or, or comments for us to move us in another direction? We've got a new commitment. David will start working on uh, kind of the prioritization of how we roll out. Um, and I think we'll, we can take that as the corridor improvement authority, the special assessments, and, and then tie that right in with the facade improvement as well from a legal framework standpoint. Okay. I, I just have a question. What is, it says 1.2B, board review and forward to planning commission. What is the status of that? I guess I don't. Which one is that, Mr. White? I'm having uh, trouble 1. hearing. 1.2B. And, and so. I don't know exactly what that means. I mean, I get it's going to the planning commission, but I don't know. What that means. And, and so, yeah, I mean, we took it. If you, if you just look at what we had is Giffels Webster gave us that review. We had Jill come and see us mm -hmm. uh, and talk about it. Then we, um, Look at our planning and zoning administrator, Mr. Smith, who's here, is like, okay, now what do we do as far as this updated plan? We have the old plan. We know that it needs to be updated. Um, at this point, it's going to end up with uh, planning and zoning and, and uh, the planning commission review. I don't know where they're at as far as if they had that on, their, on a recent agenda. So it's got to go to the planning commission before it, you know, we've got your feedback on it. We've got Jill's take on it. Um, and it just needs to go to a, a, a planning commission meeting. Okay. I've got a question on that. Have we moved forward with calling it something? Because um, North or Saginaw Street corridor just sounds so, uh, 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 you know, I think if you call it something, <laughs> it might be better. So we can refer to it in some way, you know. The miracle Mile. Whatever. <laughs> Joel Fike's Miracle Mile. Well, 
have the committee, you know, think about, you know, yeah, what yeah, would you like to call this? That's a good point. <clears throat> well, I, I've thought that too, that if we, I really don't like North End, um, I'd like to think of something more creative than, than that. We'll put our staff to work on yeah. the idea. See, branding in our Branding. A subset yeah. of the branding committee. Mm-hmm. Oh, which goes to the executive coordinator. I like where this is going. <laughs> no, I think that's a good point. And maybe the, the participants in the uh, whole process, as far as the business owners, can help us with that, too. Yeah. True. We can ask on the survey if they have any suggestions for what we call the group that represents this portion of Saginaw Street, and see if they have any thoughts on, on what to call it. So. All right. Next item in your packet, um, community connectiveness and identity, improving parks and recreation facilities. Uh, before we jump through some of the things that we've already engaged in, and we do have Parks and Rec Director Patrick Linehan here this evening. Um, I've got some, I was going to save it for a board report, but I might as well get it out there now. Uh, last Friday, we got the final, final, final uh, word on uh, the ARPA funds and what we're going to be allowed to use them for. I explained to the board previously that there was a calculation that they sent out that we had to work through to use revenue replacement. Otherwise, we were really getting pigeonholed towards water and sewer, broadband infrastructure, um, if you can't make the revenue replacement work because we had taken on fire and then we had taken on parks and recreation, it really threw off our baseline years that we had to use per that calculation. So there was no way I could make it work where we would be able to show that we were in need of revenue replacement that was um, pandemic related. Uh, they changed the rules and I've been on a webinar now that, uh, and two of them actually, one through the Michigan Townships Association and another one uh, through the Treasury that uh, they made it kind of like a standard deduction on your income taxes. They gave us the first $10 million. You don't have to, you can select the standard deduction of $10 million without having to show that calculation for revenue replacement. What that does for us is that $3.8 million that we have in ARPA funds coming in, uh, we, can, we can't use it on uh, pension and we can't use it on retiree health care. Those are kind of our restrictions, but if it's a normal governmental services uh, expenditure, we can use that funds. So I would, um, we've got time to use them before December 31st of 2024, but one of the impacts that we had greatly from COVID was parks and recreation. And the reason being they generate the vast majority of their own revenue through programming. Programming was dead in the water because of COVID-19. Uh, that really impacted what we could do with parks and recreation. So out of that $3.8 million, I'm sure we can come up with a really quick wish list. If you ask the PATH people, they'll think $3.8 million of PATHs would be awesome. If you, you know, ask Patrick, I guarantee you that he's, we've already looked at some of the things on his list, but, you know, there's lighting out at the park that um, would come in very handy. We're doing all those community events now. If we had lighting bollards along that pathway, now we've got electricity to run those uh, lights and things that we do so we don't have to use the generators out there, which makes it um, more feasible for us to run those longer term. So there's a lot of benefits that we can have by investing some of that money into our park. And another tie into the COVID for that is the usage of parks went up astronomically during COVID because of the quarantine and people suddenly discovered staying at home is okay, but you need to get out and do some outdoor recreation. So. I think we should strongly look at some type of that $3.8 million. I was before saying, look, we got plenty of water and sewer projects that we need to work on. Now I'm saying if they're going to free that up, we can use it for revenue replacement. Let's prioritize as a board where you guys want to spend that money at. But I would strongly encourage you to take a look at Parks and Recreation, some of the um, plans that Patrick has developed for the parks. I think uh, Mr. Sears is going to be very disappointed, uh, Mr. Limita. Mm -hmm. it, it, I mean, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Mr. Robertson, or Clark Robertson. Yeah, uh, perhaps uh, Patrick could, could speak to this. Um, we did a 
you and I did a drive around during my early days in my in the clerk's office, of the, and you mentioned the things that you'd like to see improved. I think you talked about it, changes in the parking and the mm -hmm. configuration of the parking. Yep. You talked about certain other areas owned by the township that could be turned into small like neighborhood parks. Um, does the things that does the money that that uh, that uh, Dennis is speaking to, could it be used for those purposes? Uh, correct, so uh, one of the main um, um, things that we've looked at for the ARPA funding even before um, this great news that I just found out about. Uh, so- I'll tell you too early. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we know you're um, gonna need more than the 3.8. Yeah, <laughs> um, so um, yeah, like uh, Superintendent Limita said, you know, we're putting on more events, a lot more people are using it, um, if you've ever, driven through Bicentennial after five o'clock uh, during the week or on a weekend. Uh, parking, especially up by the South Pavilion, is horrible. Uh, parking down by Little League uh, is horrible. So one of, one of the main projects that we're looking at is reconfiguring the parking lot and realigning the road uh, going up through the South Pavilion up to the north um, because a lot of people right now, they get lost um, and can't find the north part of the park. Now, as part of our CIP this year, we're doing signage and that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, uh, we're just, we're looking at all those sites and that. Um, and yeah, so um, I, I, a lot of those things that we talked about, you know, are the things that we're talking about. So Excellent, very good. Thank so you, Mr. The, Mr. You're welcome. So with the master, the new master plan that we're mm -hmm. working on, Yep. Uh, these, these items that I'll call them a wish list, they're probably built into that plan or? Um, the fundamentals of them are, but the specific projects are not. Um, and it's done that way. So when you're applying for the grants, you have a greater opportunity to uh, hit those benchmarks. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. So okay. Patrick, parking uh, is your top priority? It, it is one of the top priorities. And what, there, what, yes. what after that? Um, so. Uh, we also have uh, some issues with um, waste capacity in the park, uh, and then also uh, the splash pad is uh, in poor shape. Um, South Pavilion and South Playground. So those are kind of the kind of the pecking orders. Um, you know, we're still uh, checking those boxes as far as the ball fields go, and we'll continue to do that until uh, we get those to a level that we want. Uh, but you know, we have a lot of you know old infrastructure and uh, the bill is starting to come due on uh, on a lot of that so you guys all you know, I mean you're aware that when we first went out for the parks and recreation millage we're really going after deferred maintenance we had a lot of years of deferred maintenance and we've been playing catch up ever since uh, Patrick's done a good job of getting in there and taking care there was just a lot of smaller nagging issues um, that we've gone and addressed but there's some big things big ticket items like you know you talked about uh, sanitary sewer. I mean, we would love to be able to run sanitary sewer through the park because we need to expand restroom facilities. If the, you know, we've got uh, rentals going out at those lacrosse and soccer fields up on the north end, but no ability to put in smaller restroom facilities or anything. I mean, it's it's important that we that we do that. But then, I mean, putting in a sewer. Uh, lateral isn't very sexy compared to putting in you know new lighting or improving the parking or expanding a trail and we're, we're trying to balance um, we want people to see like the progress we're making so that when you get out there you say oh man you, you know because we can put sewer through there and guess what nobody knows and they think well why did you do that when you know what about this this uh, playscape over here that really needed to been updated five years ago uh, Mm -hmm. and that's what I said. We got three point eight million dollars. It would be easy to spend three point eight million dollars at the park. That's not what I'm advocating for, but I'm advocating for that we at least look at it kindly and look at the prioritization mm -hmm. of of all the possible things that we can do that are going to have the most impact. And if we tie it back to COVID related, we're using the funds like we should have for what they were yeah. meant for. Yeah, okay. we, we, when you look at uh, park usage this year, um, so a, a, and these are rough numbers. I can't tell you you know, off the top of my head what it was, but, you know, based on previous um, amounts, we budgeted revenue at about, I think it was 45,000 uh, for rentals. Um, we still have a, a, a check with standing, but, you know, we're probably gonna be around 110,000 uh, in rental fees. 
uh, for the year. And a lot of that comes down to field rentals and tournaments that come in um, on, the, uh, on the weekends. And when you look at a lot of those tournaments, um, you know, for, for the community, uh, it's a good thing because a lot of them are state to play. So, you know, we're, we're having hundreds of families come in, um, spending their money in our businesses and, uh, um, and buying Another stuff. priority is one of those parks to overcome the cell phone tower too, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, but we, we've had a conversation with the DNR recently. I'm just waiting some, uh, for some things from GIS. Uh, they are updating their policy and um, it looks like we could get that taken care of. But on the National Park Service side of it, um, you know, we may be waiting a little bit, but uh, I anticipate, um, you know, it, it to be taken care of in the year. Refresh my memory. What's the deal with that? Um, <laughs> so long story short, um, if you accept a, a Michigan DNR um, Land Water Conservation Trust Fund grant or... Um, I'm in RTF. Yes. Um, yeah. So <laughs> if you accept those grants, you have to put the property uh, in perpetuity um, where it's solely for recreation use. Um, there was a land water conservation grant for that area. Uh, the park is put into, um, uh, into that status. And then the cell phone tower was built. The cell phone tower is not a recreation use, um, which is not permitted uh, unless you get permission beforehand. Um, so uh, it was put up, uh, and then the DNR noticed at one point in time and said, um, you can't have that. <laughs> so We've encumbered parkland, yep. and that's a no-no. So when you fill out the grant application, that's minus 50 points in a very competitive uh, environment when you're trying to put your best point value forward. We shoot ourselves in the foot every time we have to fill out the grant application. We have not been successful because we lose the points. Do we get so, money from it? Yes. Yeah, yeah we get about 28000 a year. So that's one thing that... Out on 300000 Yep. And, and that's, what, that's one thing that they're looking at is that if you're actually, you know, if your parks department or your park is actually um, getting revenue from it, um, that's one of the criteria that they're now setting. They're not completely done with the change in the new policy, uh, but um, you know they should have it done here shortly. And um, you know we don't have a large easement through there. We're looking at 0 .005 acres. Um, so you know otherwise there's a conversion process that you have to do. Um, you know, and we've been working uh, through that, and that's you know creating new recreation land to replace the land um, that was encumbered that was used Can you move outside it? of that. Um, I doubt it. Yeah, I doubt it. <laughs> Those leases are they're, yeah. they're very uh, one-sided. They're very long-term, um, so it would be it would be difficult to move them so, yeah. without cooperation from the the uh, leasing. And, and the conversations I've had with the DNR recently are very productive. So, you know. so one way or the other, we're going to skin that cat. Well, I probably shouldn't use that term. But <laughs> Take care of the problem. Yeah. Uh, Dennis, for the sewer, not nothing against Jeff, but did we use any of that sewer money to put that? We we sure can. <laughs> 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 I, I, I mean, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, take, but if, if, if it's sitting there and we're not doing, I mean, I know it's busy, but it, why wouldn't we want to explore that possibility? We, we do and we have. I mean, one of the things you have to be cognizant of when we're uh, spending uh, sewer money is that um, you know we're not just using it to like anybody else wants to come in and put in a development and they or they, they want to put laterals through we say pay for your own laterals to run through your property we're not gonna we're not gonna pay for those if it's a private developer um, we try to treat the township as if we're no different than anybody else right we're not going to use funds from ratepayers to expand our sewer operations unless we fund those ourselves so we 
it's kind of critical that we uh, we hold ourselves to the same standards that we would hold anybody else coming in. Um, so it's not just going on to the rate payers because not everybody's a sewer customer. So therefore, not everybody is. It, it, it's, a, it's kind of they get a benefit that they're not necessarily paying into. Yeah, I, I, I'm wondering probably the vast majority are customers. And the only thing that I would say is it would be for the good of the community. I mean, this is a, a private development. It's, we're not making money off this. This is to uh, help the community. I don't disagree, but we also have some available federal funds. And we've had this conversation about, you know, as part of this, it, as we start looking for the prioritization of projects through our park system, um, this is probably a pretty important one for us because we've got some issues and we're going to have to address them. And it's, you know, it's a general fund expenditure, but we also have some funds right now that wouldn't impact us if we were to okay. utilize it for sewer funds and it's a it, it's approved use of the funds that we have. Okay. Well, some of those infrastructure projects too, before we get into doing a lot of other improvements, it's important you, you know, it's kind of put the foundation in before you start building the house and, these are kind of foundation issues that we're talking about, whether it's um, electrical for lighting or sewer for, you know, expansion of buildings or splash pad and what have you. So I think while it's not sexy, it, it puts the stuff in place to be able to get the, the good stuff. Mm -hmm. So, all right, any other questions for Mr. Lanahan? I, I do. Mr. Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. <laughs> White or... I'll go. Miss, okay. My, Mr. White. <laughs> not Miss. <Yeah. laughs> you go. Um, my question, and, and I remember getting a, uh, it was a map, and you had sort of identified areas where you thought mm -hmm. maybe, hey, there'd be a good for a park. Is, right. Has that gone anywhere? Is that just sort of a, so, I don't say pie in the sky, but right. is that? Well, so as part of quarter one uh, of this year, uh, we're going to create some uh, site plans for some of those. Um, Director Sears and I have talked about um, there's a Wellfield site um, over off Norfolk. Um, there will be another site that we'll be coming into here shortly um, for a township property. Um, and uh, also the triangle uh, coming into uh, Grand Blank Township uh, from the city of Grand Blank on Grand Blank Road. Um, so those were included on that. Um, you know, we're certainly looking at property going through, um, but, you know, right now, uh, the way that we would acquire it is either through um, a, a foreclosure uh, or, you know, if somebody's willing to donate. Um, you know, right now, we don't quite have the ability to procure land like that. Um, you know, we've got all this deferred maintenance that we have to do. Um, so to, uh, you know, get that land, um, but we're, we're definitely looking at those sites and, you know, trying to work with, uh, developers and that coming in and, uh, you know, trying to get recreation space that way. And I, and I didn't know that, that <clears throat> Lost Lake Preserve, I don't know, is that the actual name of yep. it? I didn't know if there was any option for something kind of similar to that. Yeah. So, um, the Southwest Michigan, uh, Nature Conservancy does own that. Uh, I know back when that was coming to fruition, um, The, the the county and that was uh, approached and that, you know, Oakland County kind of took the lead, um, you know, but I believe there's actually more acreage in uh, our township than there is down in Holly Township for it. Um, you know, we could certainly look at that, you know, access on the north end. Um, what was the question, though? Is, Mr. Well, my, I guess, I mean, that's, I'm glad to know this. I, my question was more if we explored any other sort of similar opportunities with other groups to maybe do kind of a public, private, I'm not, I mean, cause mm -hmm. it's owned in the, by that conservancy, right? Yes, yes. But it's just open to the public? Correct. Okay. Yeah, I, I, but, yeah. but the access on the north side uh, are residents that own that property, so I'm yeah, not that's sure you're going to get drive any. drive coming in off. You're not going to get any access from that end, but... Uh, going south down Holly Road and then turning left on, I'm not sure the name of the road, but it's the road before the National Cemetery. Evans? Evans. Evans. Yeah. You're going to have access off Evans to the uh, two-mile pathway that goes back in there. But it's not very well marked. <laughs> no. You go down Evans Road, you'll see a small parking lot. But It's a beautiful park. I, did I think it's by... Check it out. 
I think it's intentionally because you know it's not meant to be a Park recreational area. It's yeah, meant to be a nature conservancy. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. So we're definitely looking at those areas. Um, you know, I have a uh, I have another map in my office. You know, that kind of uh, that kind of shows you know where we're deficient in that. So. Patrick, what's the national standard? There's a um, how many minutes you should be away from being able to walk or access? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. To ten minutes for a neighborhood park, uh, which is a quarter mile, or three miles for like a neighborhood park or a community park. So like Bicentennial, you know, is a um, is a three mile, and that. So you know, and, and that can be you know that can be a you know a small uh, mini or pocket park. It can be a larger neighborhood park, um, and that. So. You know, it, it, it all depends. I'm assuming that will be one of the goals that will appear in our new master plan or mm -hmm. five-year master yep. plan. Yep, yep, exactly. That's a pretty steep hill. Ten minutes away from a park anywhere right. in the township. Well, and, you know, the, 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 this is a goal for the future, you know, as we're building out. You know, you go down and talk to, like, West Bloomfield Parks and Rec, um, you know, and they're still trying to, um, you know, meet that standard. Their problem is, is the township was built out in the 70s, and, you know, now it's, you know, it's hard to fit those parks in. We have the opportunity here that half of our township hasn't been built out yet, so. Miss Hugo, I apologize. Oh, you're fine. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if anything is ever put down to control the dust. In the oh, park. In the park? Yeah. yeah. So we will be going out for bid uh, on both grading and um, chloride. The only problem is on the north part of the park, it's crushed concrete and chloride will not work. Um, we really don't have um, a way to um, keep the dust down on that, unfortunately, on the north end, uh, oh. but on the south end, definitely. I, I've spoken with Mr. Sears. I don't know if uh, he's spoken with you, but that permazine is something we should definitely check out if you want to make note of that. They're, they're using it on several of our gravel roads in the township, and uh, it's working pretty well. Um, what it is, it's actually an enzyme that mixes in with the, uh, they actually grind up the road, the gravel road, and mix in this enzyme during the summer months. And uh, the heat actually and water <clears throat> cause that enzyme to be a binding factor and it binds together the uh, the various uh, minerals in the, the road, and it almost becomes as solid as concrete. Um, if it at any time gets disturbed, you know whether somebody, um, you know, tears it up somehow, all they have to do is come in and uh, grind up that area again and roll it out, and the enzymes reactivated, and it binds again and. Uh, works really well. The county, uh, most of the townships actually, we were fortunate in that uh, consumers paid for us to have it on several roads, but um, McWayne Road, if you drive down McWayne, you'll notice uh, that they did it this past summer and it, it it's held up really well. So I think we, we definitely should explore um, using something like that until we get it paved. But uh, you can talk to Mr. Sears about that permazyme and he'll I think tell you a little bit more. So, thank you. Yep. Anything else for Mr. Linehan? Okay. Thank you very much. Next item on the grid was uh, enhanced code enforcement. Obviously, we have a great deal of discussion about this, um, and really, a lot of the discussion revolved around uh, changing how we viewed it instead of being. Uh, reactive to be more proactive. You can see Supervisor Bennett smiling because he shared a text or email that he received from a friend that wants to know why we're enforcing uh, the RV trailer parking ordinance that isn't hurting anybody in his driveway. Um, but that's part of being more proactive. That's going to happen. And well, they put the blame on the township board. They said the township board is uh, really pushing code enforcement. I was going to say, well, Let's put it back on the superintendent. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm here to serve. <laughs> well, since, since, since you're on that, uh, one, I, I was told, because I don't participate in Facebook or anything, but I was told that one of the comments was that they were wondering about the process if they get fined, if they get a, 
if if they're notified, this is maybe for for David. Uh, what's the fine, and how long do they have to fix it? So, so there there is a process where there are several warnings and several contacts with with people that may be in violation, and if the, if it can't be resolved through the the information process from the code enforcement officers, then they'll issue tickets, and then once those tickets get filed, they'll go to the uh, di the 67th district court and. I will come face to face with those folks and have a discussion with them about what the problem is with complying. Um, very often, we're able to resolve it at, at that level. If we can't resolve it, then the court has had um, uh, hearings on these municipal civil infractions. And if you're found responsible, which is an interesting, I know you'll appreciate this, but the, the standard of proof isn't beyond a reasonable doubt, uh, it, and you don't get a, a trial by jury. It's just a preponderance of the evidence, meaning it's more likely than not that you violated it. And then if, uh, and then the judge can issue a fine of anywhere from zero to $500 plus actual cost um, um, to bring the action. Very, uh, also the court has the, the very unusual power to order that, that offending condition removed or remedied. And so if somebody doesn't move their your trailer, for example, then we have the authority to go hire a, a tow company and, and have it towed off to a storage place. So um, that would, that's the worst case scenario. I want to say 99% of the time it gets resolved before it gets to that point. I, I want to just mention too in that regard, Mr. Erden, is that uh, we, we've hired two excellent uh, new uh, code enforcement individuals in the past, what, six months? and uh, four, both retired police officers from the city of Flint, and they're doing a phenomenal job. Uh, I think what they'll tell you is that uh, they're able to get compliance uh, pretty much on the spot, um, and that's, that's their goal, really, is to not write any tickets. And, uh, you know, and I, I think our, our police are the same route with, you know, speeding, what have you. They don't want to have to write tickets, and probably most of the time, I'm trying not to, but um, they do reserve that right. But my conversation with them just walking down the hallway is that they get compliance uh, over and over again just from, you know, complaints that I hand off to them from residents. So, Yeah, but the, the concern that was relayed to me is that they would, and I know this isn't the case, but I would like, you know, that one that spoke to, is that you would, the police or the code enforcement would show up, issue you a ticket. But I, there's like a 10-day letter that they get first. I mean, it's nothing as, as dire as that. Right. No, and there's, there's plenty of warning and plenty of opportunity to, to resolve the issue. And, and then, again, once, once I'm face-to-face -face with them, that, that helps as well. Again, most of the time it gets resolved. I will say, though, that when it doesn't get resolved and people, people try their luck in front of the judge, they're not happy with the result very often. And so it's, it's been anybody who's who's got this issue uh, that they're dealing with, get it resolved before we get to court because it could, could cost you some money. Yeah. I think they started the enforcement in my neighborhood <laughs> because I did hear that it's uh, that guy that lives down there that's causing us to get all this stuff. <laughs> but uh, hopefully my neighbors will understand that it's a township-wide uh, effort. Well, you know, if you look at overall what our, our goal was, again, under the community vitality umbrella, enhanced code enforcement, because there were several areas where, um, you know, being reactive like we were, we reacted to complaints, and then, again, it, it, the whole process, we're still trying to revise and streamline it. We're looking at it as part of our overall uh, revamp of the new website as well, that it's easier to find a complaint form on code enforcement to submit so that if, if we're not out there, but we do have two guys who are out there. We used to only have one plus the, you know, we have a union staff member who is really good, folks on a lot of the noxious weeds and signage complaints, and then having the, we had one part-time. Now we have two. We added that one. I think that's, you're going to see some of that, and you're going to hear more about it because more people are going to have it. I think the interactions, though, by and large, have been have been mostly positive. And again, voluntary compliance is the township's goal. We're not looking to, we're not looking to issue civil infractions, nor do we want to have the hassle of of going to court or sending David to court with the code enforcement officers. We know that's going to be a part of it. But the the over uh, arching goal here is is that we're going to have a uh, you're you're going to notice a difference in our in our neighborhoods, right? We're not going to have some of the blight 
uh, and things that we had. And I, I think you'll see that impact as we move along. We did budget, I will point out, for an additional part-time code enforcement person if we need. At this point, Director Sears is saying that he doesn't believe that we need to fill that position, at least at this time of the year. We'll see how we get with the, you know, with the addition of one more part-time person, and then we'll, we'll have that conversation. We'll report that through the year as we go. If you guys are getting feedback, and we, you know, we had this conversation, a frank conversation when we talked about enhanced code enforcement efforts is that you're probably going to maybe get some complaints. You might get a phone call as a trustee or a, you know, the supervisor saying, you know, Hey, what the heck? I'm your neighbor. And you know, they just came in and told me I have to clean this up or I can't have my trailer parked here. Uh, that's all part of it. Um, our guys are going to look at that enforcement as voluntary compliance. And, and again, the, the, one of the biggest, you know, things we're going to have is that, parking in the driveway for trailers, you know, RVs, boats. Um, and, you know, Jeremy has lended uh, certainly his expertise coming from Davison Township. We've had these conversations. We may be coming to the board with some different suggestions about how we handle that. I think uh, Jeremy had shared that with the board on, you know, maybe we expand it a little bit more uh, between May and October and, and tighten it up a little bit after that. Uh, but it really truly is about a 50-50 thing in the township from what we've seen, and that's going to be the most controversial one. Blight, the, you know, most people agree on what blight looks like, and, and most people don't push back too hard when we're, when we're dealing with a blight complaint. But that RV ordinance is going to be a tough one. That's the one you guys are going to get uh, tangled up in uh, as we work through this. But if that's the ordinance and that's what we're, where we want to go as a community, we're going to enforce it. We're going to make sure that people understand that through an educational process and maybe over the course of a year with proactive enforcement versus reactive enforcement, that becomes less and less of an issue that we have to deal with, quite frankly. And just for our people at home that might be watching, what is the ordinance again? How long are you allowed to park your boat or your RV in your driveway? I'm thinking, it, is it a 48 hours uh, <clears throat> limit? Two days. Or you got to move it. Okay. Two days from the time that they're noti notified. Well, it's supposed to be <laughs> yeah. two days. But, but then part of it is we notice them, but, but then they have, you know, realistically, we send the letter out, and until we come back around, so it may be longer than two days before we can. But if they leave and come back, then it starts over. Mm. Well, that yeah, and and I and when I explain that to people, I say, look, the, the purpose of that of that forty eight hours is to allow allow you to load and unload. It's not it's not so that we you know we're we're not mark, chalking your tires and playing a game here. Mm -hmm. that, that the policy behind it's a matter of convenience, and most people understand that once they're kind of forced to reckon with it. Mm -hmm. Once the police knock on your door, not yeah. that happened to me, but <laughs> for the camper. <laughs> okay. Well, again, else? are we on the right track? Off? Is there something else that you would like staff to be considering or doing differently than we're doing now? Um, and Amy does do a great job with with the sign elimination and the grass cutting. So, I guess that. my my sorry. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, my question not only is a question, and and I get that especially this time of year there may not be a need for another person, but. I mean, making maybe one of the positions seasonal. I mean, uh, it seems like May through October, there's going to be way more issues mm -hmm. and then when everyone's hunkered down in the winter and people don't really care. What one of the things I think that's happening, though, is they're getting on top of things that we haven't been able to just because of staffing level. And I think, you know, as, as Mr. Lehman had mentioned, some of this stuff is going to become more of a norm than us chasing people down so you know our, our level of expectations are going to become a little bit more known than what they have been and so it's not going to be uh, it might be a reminder to some people but most of them will have already been notified um, so I, I think you know you, you bring up a valid concern but I think what Mr. Lima is saying is if we find the need um, we reserve you know the right to be able to or not the right but the, the budget is there for bringing in another part-time person and that could be a, a summer you know, or seasonal because it does pick up during the summer as far as the grass mowing and the the amount of signage that people are putting out you know illegally 
There are 11,640 single family residences in the township. Um, so when you think about that, and we've got two part-time guys heading out and one you know, full-time person who also works out of the office and does office work, um, mm -hmm. it's not a lot of hours in there for policing nearly 12,000 specific right. properties, plus businesses, plus signage, plus yeah. um, mm -hmm. it, 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 I'd say with uh, um, it might make sense for that position, to, another seasonal position in the summer, because that the weeds ordinance adds a whole new thing, and the signs are uh, uh, really pop up in the summer. Those warmer months, it's mm -hmm. garage sales, it's everything. Um, right. It's the wolf power wash your house signs, um, and a lot of them are repeat offenders, who they come and and they blanket us, and Amy spends a whole day chasing. You know, we hang Christmas lights. Um, we power wash decks and houses. Uh, they they come in and these people come in and they they just blast through, uh, you know, thirty two square miles of 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 signs. Um, and she's good at chasing them down and finding them. And uh, but it's, the repeat offenders sometimes that's the frustrating part uh, because they know they can't do it, so they hit us and they disappear. And then the following year, it's the same. Doggone company that comes out and does it again. Okay. Anything else on? We uh, high quality housing and, and talking about improving and enforcing rental housing standards and ordinances. As you can see by the monitoring or initiated, um, we're not really there, but most of it was planned for uh, a 2022 and 2023 project. We had a lot going on last year, and this wasn't planned to be attacked until 2022. I started to do the research in the fourth quarter about what other municipalities are doing about uh, looking at improving and enforcing rental housing standards and ordinances. Um, it's a mixed bag out there. I, you get a lot of information from people say, if you're not doing it, don't do it. Don't open that can of worms. You'll be sorry. People who did it and then stopped doing it. Other people who say, oh, no, it, it's a fantastic program. Uh, Mount Pleasant has a really good uh, rental program. Uh, other places have, have done it. It depends on how far you want to go with what we're doing. A lot of them <coughs> will make it for like three years, for example. So they'll go in and do an inspection, but they're only going to inspect that rental property. You're gonna, you have to register it, so you have to have some type of rental registration. If you don't have, and for us, you know, how do we track it? Well, if they don't have a, a principal residence exemption, that tells us that it's either a second home or potential rental property. But we will probably end up having to put an ordinance in place on rental that requires registration of rental properties. It includes a, a, a fee for inspection purposes. And then that inspection is good from anywhere from one year to three years. Or when the tenants change out, you're required to get another inspection. There's a lot of ways that we can do it. So we're, we're only in the exploratory phases. Um, there is going to be some costs involved. Uh, there are companies that you can hire who will run your rental inspection for the municipality. Uh, they'll follow your ordinance and they go out. Um, again, there's a, a cost involved. We're still in the, in, we're taking baby steps into this thing. This is a big one and we expect to move this forward through 2022. It might be a 2023 launch. Because again, adoption of an ordinance, discussion of fees, uh, how far do we want to go? Are we, what are we looking for? Are we looking for safety standards? Are we looking for compliance with the property maintenance code? Are we making sure that they have working smoke alarms and carbon dioxide detectors? How far do we, how far do we want to go? So this will come to the board. Uh, I'd say we're on track with it because we didn't really intend to get uh, way into this until 2022. Mr. Lehman, where would uh vacation rentals fall in there? Well, that's a whole other thing that you'd have to discuss if we're looking for short-term rentals versus, um, you know, long-time rentals. And again, uh, depending on how that legislation goes on the short-term rentals or whether or not we can even regulate short-term rentals, uh, that remains to be seen. I'm just thinking in terms of, you know, if, if I have a rental home and you have a a vacation rental home and they're right next to each other you might rent i mean if i were smart i'd i'd sell, i'd rent mine as a vacation rental because i can rent it by the week 
as opposed to by the month. And I'm, I'm aware of uh, one home here in Grand Blanc that's renting for about $1,000 a week when you total up the per day cost. Um, and if I were renting that house as an individual, I probably at most would get, you know, $1,500 maybe a month. So it's kind of behooves me to rent it as an Airbnb or VRBO instead of uh, doing a, you know, monthly or annual rental for, for a resident. So I'm just thinking that <clears throat> if we're going to end up with a standard, it probably we want to consider looking at, uh, you know, vacation rentals under the same or some kind of similar criteria, because otherwise um, I, I think that's the route that you're gonna see a lot more people going. We have a number of people that have to uh, spend time here in the Grand Blank area, whether it's doing residency at the hospital or uh, whatever the case may be, doing some training at one of the universities. They're only here for a short period of time. And uh, we may wanna look at those if we're going to uh, have any kind of rental uh, policy, but if that legislation passed, it's right. not going to matter, correct? And yeah. so, if I was a person that was rent. like, uh, if I was going to rent a place, I would always rent it for on a week by week basis. Mm -hmm. Why put yourself in the position of having to mm -hmm. be follow our rules? Right. I mean, mm -hmm. and David, with that. Probably fly that way. You're, well, you're exactly right. I mean, we'll have to see what happens with that with the short-term rental issue. Because yeah, I mean, we, so when we write this, we want to we want to we want to figure out the burden that we're going to place on on the, the owners of the property, um, and also their options. And if their options are are an end around, we got to close that gap, right? Somehow. Okay. Anybody else have anything else on there? So we would tie this in with a business license, do you think, as well, Mr. Lehman? We can. You know, I've been, I've been a proponent of business licenses, and it's been, since I got here, it's been met with um, mixed enthusiasm, I would say, from previous boards. Uh, you know, it's, I'm not, again, this isn't a fundraiser. It's not trying to charge everybody 100 bucks to have a business license. Um, I think you put the cost as nominal, and you have it. Maybe, it, you know, the whole point behind it is if we know – Businesses change out, especially from a um, fire department standpoint and from the building department. Uh, people go in and they make some changes. They move interior walls, they close doors, they bring in different, you know, they might have 55 gallon drums of acetone in a place that didn't used to, but they use it because now they do some painting or arts crafts or whatever. And we don't know that. And so the fire department believes that they know what they're going into when they get down there and they go into a building and now that door no longer exists and there's two 55 gallon drums of explosive material behind there. They thought it was maybe paper storage. I mean, it, and there was another door to get out. So there's, a, there's very valid reasons for that business license. It also gives us the opportunity to have a uh, registry of these folks. So when we need to get some information out, we've got a registry of, of the license and it also lets people know, like from a, a marijuana standpoint, that we don't allow retail marijuana stores in. If somebody comes in like, yeah, I'd like to get my business license because I want to, you know, create a, uh, my new uh, marijuana retail store, like, okay, we're sorry, but, you know, this it stops here. We don't allow those. We have moratorium against them in our community. Um, I only bring that up because in Marquette Township, we had the happy carrot sprout up one time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and while they claimed they weren't a marijuana store, if you looked on their Facebook page, they had like, you know, today's offerings. <laughs> um, and that was before, uh, that was all medical, of course. Uh, but it was, uh, it, it's one of those things where it's just valuable for us. And, and plus, we get an opportunity to meet new business owners when they come in and they're, hey, I'm going to put in a hair salon in here. And, and they're dealing with planning and zoning and building to get their business license, and it's like, oh, guess what? You need a special land use to go in there. There's a lot of things, there's a lot of good reasons why we should consider a building like, you know, or a business license. Um, and again, charge 10 bucks. I don't care what the fee is, but just you got to have it in order to do business here. Well, I shared with you a message earlier this week, and I got another one today from the same individual who's complaining about a neighbor that he believes is running a business out of their home and it's some kind of landscape business or what have you that 
the equipment's in the driveway and they, the workers get there real early in the morning and make all kind of noise. Uh, and they feel as though that, you know, they ask us if, if they have a license to do this. And we said, we don't license landscape businesses. And, you know, but in this case, uh, you would probably need to register that he is running an operation out of his driveway or whatever. But, it, it, that can be a problem. We had one uh, in another municipality where it was the same thing. It was a landscape business, and they, they came in, and the guy took his backyard. He bought a house in a residential neighborhood on this little cul-de-sac, and he took and he graveled his backyard for employee parking. He brought all of his trailers in, and they had all the equipment in it. Folks would pull in and park, jump in a truck with a trailer attached to it, and head out for the day and come back, and so it became a commercial parking area in his yard uh, running you know these landscapes he's like well i'm not really operating a business i just park my vehicles here um but it becomes it no longer looks like a residential business and that was what our residential ordinance said is residential business ordinance from the outside nobody should be able to tell that there's a business running um and when you have an employee parking lot or they're parking on the street uh and it especially was in a neighborhood where before my tenure there uh, they had shut down a woman who was running her home daycare for her own two children and taken on another two or three kids, and they went in and shut her down. And then a year later, there's a guy running a landscape business with a gravel parking lot. Uh, it didn't go over well. That's another great reason why you license businesses, so that when they come in, you say, what are you planning on doing? And, and like, oh, no, it, you, that's not a thing. You can't do that here. Right. Um, because then it became a court battle and took two years to clean up. Next item on our, your grid is pension and OPEB funding for community vitality, especially from a financial perspective. Uh, again, the board in last month uh, put $1.6 million onto the uh, retiree health care plan uh, into our investment account with MERS. Um, that shows you're continuing to make that progress. We are starting to go, and we had a brief conversation about the defined benefit plan. Unfortunately, I wasn't at the meeting when your MERS representative, Matt Taylor, was here, but I did watch it. Um, I thought the meeting went well, trying to do a broad kind of an overview for the board as we prepare to move forward into our union negotiations with the police department uh, in 2022. We're going to have to define our strategy, one of the conversations we had. Um, you know, I think that we've done a really good job with our retiree health care. I think we need to keep our foot on the gas and keep moving there, but we do need to continue to explore uh, what our negotiation strategy is for those contracts. We made promises to the men and women of the police department, and a lot of them based their, hey, I'm going to stick around here for my career. I'm putting my 20 or 25 years in, and uh, based upon the promises that you made me. It's the same thing we said to them about retiree health care. We made promises to you, and we're going to live up to those promises, but we might have to tweak it to get there. I think we should take a similar strategy as we prepare for negotiations uh, with the police department on their defined benefit pension plan. We have a great defined contribution plan uh, for all the other employees. Uh, we're contributing 15%. I mean, that's a very lucrative benefit. I think it, it bodes well. Uh, but you'll hear if you talk to some of the officers right now, they will tell you that it's reaching a level where it's becoming a hardship. Their, their take-home pay isn't what it was 10 years ago or 12 years ago. Uh, because it's a it's a it's a phenomenal benefit, but it's an expensive benefit. And as the assumptions changed, the cost of participation went up. The township's paying an additional 27 percent this year. Uh, on top, you know, we pay 27 percent of payroll to get this defined benefit pension plan. Employees are paying 15 percent. So every officer over there for, that has that uh, defined benefit pension plan paying additional 15 percent. Next January, that could be 17%. You know, ours could go to 29%. At what point do we say we can't afford the benefit anymore? Um, we've done a good job. It's been funded. You know, we're, we're in the 50s. I'd be a lot more comfortable if we were in the 90s. Uh, we tried it uh, three years ago and, and came up with a few different scenarios on kind of doing a hybrid, uh, changing some of the parameters. Again, we're going to explore every one of those options. Uh, including we need to look at what if we just stopped doing a defined benefit contribution altogether, ended it, bonded out uh, the amount, 
Well, that puts it all squarely on uh, the township taxpayers to pay for that benefit, takes that onus off of the uh, employees. Um, a lot of places have gone to that. If you can afford to do it short term, you're going to take a huge hit. Long term, it makes sense because we're, we're ending the benefit and the folks who are on it now, there won't be any new ones coming on. Uh, we could do a hybrid where these guys are on their benefit and they're riding it out, but it stopped right now and now they're on the defined contribution plan. All new employees are on you know, defined contribution or there's some share where they're 50-50 or 60-40 defined benefit and then defined contribution to try to lower our long-term costs. Uh, again, looking at you know the the benefit itself, uh, taking a look at the cost of living allowance, you know, 2.5 percent cola on there, should that be lowered as part of a of an overall picture? Last time we approached it, it's got a 2.5 multiplier. Should it be at 2.25 or 2.0? Yes, it impacts the amount that the employers are going to get in their retirement. But whatever they've earned up to this date, when we make the change. Uh, they've earned and they just go to the new one moving forward it will impact but at the same time uh, so does I mean we're it, as a recruitment tool it's a great recruitment tool but at some point 20 percent if I'm a new officer just coming on board and I'm asking to pay take 20 percent of my paycheck out to pay for the defined benefit plan I'm at some point it becomes a detriment instead of a recruitment tool and, and we're close I mean we we have to get there uh, I think our employees, our officers recognize that. We've got, you know, we've, we're also darn proud here of our police department and the men and women of our department. Um, we got to keep our promises to them, but we're, we're going to have to tweak those promises. And we, we've got to come up with something that you can live with as a board and that they can live with uh, as employees that, that still gives them that security in their retirement, but one that we, we can afford. And we, we got to get this thing under control. We got to get it paid for. And and there's a, there's there's a one time opening for us to do this, but it's just one and done, correct? Correct. It, 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 as part of the MERS program, if we make some adjustments to the plan itself, last time what I was pushing for was to just take it from a two point five to a two two five multiplier. That would have dropped the employees' participation rate back down to eight percent. Would have brought the townships participation rate back down to 15%. And then what I agreed to do uh, as a negotiation tool was at that time we were paying 22.67%. Put it in writing that the township would continue to pay 22.67% until such time as we became 100% funded. The calculation was that it would have been less than 10 years. Um, you know, and of course, Still adjustments could happen, the market could drop, the assumptions could change, and, and then we would have split the cost moving up. So there could have still been some shared cost coming on us. But I, I truly believe that we, we could have gotten that thing nearly 100% funded um, in less than 10 years. Unfortunately, uh, for whatever reason, that didn't work out in negotiations. Um, I'm afraid that it might be the 225 won't be the answer this time. It might have to be a 2.0 or it might be a combination of 225 and, and a COLA adjustment or something. But it's one time. Once you've agreed to do that, you can never change that MERS plan again. You'd have to close the plan and reopen another one. And, and that's the selling point would be for uh, patrol and the command is that nothing changes again. Yeah, we couldn't come back at the next negotiation and say, now we want to take you down to a, right. you know, couldn't be done. You'd have to close that plan and then come up with a new. And, and, I, and I think uh, you said 50%, but I think we're 69% funded in, in that patrol plan, 68%. It, well, it depends. We're 63% funded if I look at the 5572s that we have to report. We report differently. Uh, for our financial reports than we do from the ones that we get from MERS. Um, and so, yes and yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bottom line is we have more funding needs for it. it we, we do. We, we have to be throwing money at it isn't going to work because we don't have it, right? I mean, in a perfect world, it would be this is a great benefit and, and thank God we're going to take care of our people that, you know, came work for us. But you know, at, at some point we gotta 
we can't be paying 50 percent in addition of wages right, right? i mean it's it, we have to come up with a plan that works and before your unfortunate incident about two years ago ish before that i mean the hiatus so, yeah i mean seriously you did have a good working relation with with the uh, bargaining units i mean you you were I mean, so there's no reason why you don't think you couldn't get this resolved. I, I, I don't. I, w w I will tell you this. Um, when I got here, we were able to get those contracts negotiated the first round. Uh, my first year here, it was the first time in the history of Grambling Township and the police department that we settled contracts before the expiration date. I thought we were on track to do the same thing with the next round, but unfortunately, through a variety of reasons, that didn't work out. Right, right. right. But that's what I say. You have no reason to think that you couldn't be real successful. The, I, th I, th I think all groups want to get this. The, the, folk, the, the union groups that we have, all three police unions, um, negotiate in good faith. They all understand the situation. We have a great working relationship. I have the utmost respect and confidence in, in that we can get this done, that they act in there, just like they did with health care. They came in, and that was a pretty big ask for health care. And they didn't even know me that well. I'd only been here a year. We were able to get that done, and we lived up. The township did everything we said we were going to do. Um, we, we took the extra money that we saved, we put it on OPAB, and we continued to pound it. We were 13% funded. We moved it to 56% funded five years. Nothing short of phenomenal. That's what we told them we were going to do, and we did it. So I think we, we have a track record. Right. I have a question before we go on. Um, so we, we, the remainder of the strategic plan that we want to cover is the infrastructure, right? And then the other one is the uh, IT infrastructure. Is that? Yep, those, those are the last two remaining. We want to try and cover those yet tonight, or do we want to wait till our next meeting to cover those? Because those I don't want to gloss over anything, you know, quickly or anything. But we have a lot on the next one for sure. And IT, um, I can, I know how to turn this on. So you yeah. might want to have Nate here to have that conversation with you. <laughs> so do we want to cover infrastructure, or do we want to wait till the next meeting, or what's your thought, wait. Mr. Lima? Want to wait? I would. Yeah, or is, yeah let's, let's wait until uh, it's getting a little bit late. Yep, yeah. more items. And, and uh, let, let's cover these two. If everybody, we have a consensus here on the board that we cover these last two, because I want to make sure we're putting the time into them. Is that all right with you, Mr. White? Um, then we'll cover those two at our next meeting then. So I want to make sure we're thorough and not just glossing over them. We're getting a little bit light here. Thank you, Mr. Supervisor. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Anything else that we want to make sure we cover with regard to the strategic plan next meeting? Okay. We'll make sure we cover those. I think it's good that we're going over these and getting it fresh and making any updates. Okay, under new business, uh, the board will consider a motion to approve Nelson Tank Services proposal of $27,430 to provide design and engineering services for the Baldwin Road, or I'm sorry, for the Baldwin Water Tower painting project and authorize the township superintendent to execute all related contracts and documents. So, Mr. Sears. So, if I I recall correctly, it, to to paint a water tower ends up being close to eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollars typically. Um, this one is uh, projected to be around five hundred thousand dollars. Five hundred thousand. Yeah. This is uh, the the past couple we've painted have come in around four hundred. Oh. This is a million gallon tank, so it's a little bit bigger than the other two that we have. Um, so it'll be a little bit more expensive. Are we looking at uh, putting our logo on there? Well, we're not looking at anything yet, but yes, that, that's definitely on my radar. Uh, you know, we have the design that we've put on the last two towers, uh, being that this tower was, is the big white one that you see when you come into town, is so much more visible than the others, then yes, maybe our logo would be more appropriate this there. This is visible from I-75 as well, I believe. It's right on I-75, correct. Are we looking at uh, lighting it? Uh, again, the, it's all open right now. We haven't really discussed it all that much yet. I have seen uh, some of the latest water tower designs where they actually use LED lights to right. uh, to light them so they can actually change colors based on what's going on. Sure. 
that time of the year. So there's a lot of them that you see all around the country that do a lot of creative things. Um, you know, we we've always gone with just a basic design, but we can definitely get creative. I'd like to see. I mean, with it being so visible in I-75, we're we're talking about signage and branding. Sure. Some creative thing that we can do that's not uh, real expensive. Yeah. As long as all my ARPA funding doesn't get taken away, maybe we can do something fun. <laughs> we don't have any ARPA. <laughs> we don't allow billboards, but uh, this is a water tower, so I don't think it qualifies as a billboard. But, but it more or less is a, a great advertising tool for Grand Blank Township. I believe at one time, I, I wasn't on the township board, but I heard that in years past, somebody wanted to make that look like a golf ball. Yeah, when they were building this one, that was a proposal because uh, the Buick Open was still here, and they they toyed with the notion of making it a golf ball on a, a tee. Golf ball on top of a tee. Yeah. So, so they've got the basketball down in Detroit or down river, I think. That oh, there's a lot of different, I mean, marathon. a lot of different designs out there for sure. Yeah. Hmm. All right. So... Is a motion in order, Mr. Supervisor? So I don't know, did you have anything you wanted to state before I... No, this is just for um, to hire Nelson Tank Services to provide the design and engineering services for it. Um, believe it or not, there's a lot of engineering that goes into painting a water tower. So um, they'll make sure all the specifications for the paint coatings are right. They'll design it for us however we want. And then uh, they'll do all the uh, bidding and uh, inspections also. So would they... Excuse me, would they come up with designs for lighting if we told them? Maybe yeah, absolutely. That? They'll definitely help us out with that. Yep. The, if we want to put our logo on it and absolutely different color choices, what have you. Yep. And this year? This is a this year project, yeah. It, it was originally slated for around 2024. We recently had an inspection done, and we found some delamination of that paint coating inside the tank, which is not dangerous or harmful or anything. They're just bubbles at this point. And there's a lot of sediment in the bottom of it, too. So we had to move it up to this fiscal year. So that's in the DDA area. It is in the DDA, huh? Yeah, they could pay for it. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that. I'm saying that we should promote the DDA if it's oh, in the okay. DDA area. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, Dr. Raritan makes the motion supported by Ms. Hugo. Okay, motion by Raritan, supported by Hugo. Okay. Trustee White. Yes. Trustee Raritan? Yes. Trustee Fike? Yes. Trustee Hugo? Yes. Myself? Yes. Supervisor Bennett? Yes. Six nothing, motion passes. Item B, the board will consider a motion to approve row PCS or PSC's uh, proposal of $38,100 to provide design engineering services on three sanitary sewer reconstruction projects in various locations in the township and authorize the township superintendent to execute all related contracts and documents. Mr. Sears. So we have in our CIP for this year, three sanitary sewer uh, reconstruction projects. Um, probably 90% of the time when we do work in our sanitary sewer system, we do trenches to repair now. So we do liners, we do point uh, filling, stuff like that, grouting. We very rarely have to reconstruct sur or surgery, sewer. In this instance, we have three sections that are either flowing backwards or uh, we have manhole settling um, that is obstructing the flow of sewer. So we can't fix those with liners. Unfortunately, they have to be dug up and reconstructed. Um, so these are three areas that we have been um, effectively maintaining for probably a decade now. Um, but recently, there's been an uptick in needed maintenance, so it's time to look at the reconstruction of them. Uh, the proposal to you uh, before you tonight is from Roe to again do the design and engineering for those projects and then go out for bid for the construction. If all goes well and permitting goes well, we could uh, be breaking ground on these in the fall probably. Uh, but it'll take us a good six months to do the permitting and design portion of the project. Any thoughts or concerns? I think a motion's in order. I'll make that motion, Mr. Supervisor. Okay, supported by Trustee Fike. All right. Trustee Hugo? Yes. Trustee Fike? Yes. Trustee Raritan? Yes. Trustee White? Yes. Um, myself? Yes. Supervisor Bennett? Yes. Six nothing. Motion passes. Thank you.
Item C, the board will consider a motion to approve zoning change case number 669 for parcel 12-04-300-018 from R3 single family residential to GC general commercial. We have Mr. Smith. Good evening. Good evening. So on January 6, 2022, the Planning Commission voted 7-0 to zero to recommend approval of this zoning case number 669 for parcel 12-04-300-018. The applicant is, is requesting the back half of the parcel be uh, rezoned from R3 to general commercial. The front portion of the parcel is already a general commercial. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Department would recommend a motion for approval uh, from R3 to GC for the back portion, and that's it. Um, in your packet, you have a map showing they're only rezoning. They're purchasing. The proposed uh, use is going to take over three parcels, but the uh, only one in question for rezoning is the one that's shaped in an L. Only the, it's a, Basically, it's cleaning up because the zoning lines, they never should have cut this property in half. It should have followed the property lines. Is everybody familiar with where this property is? I wasn't, but no. This is next to the Midas shop on Saginaw Street. Right at the point. Right at the point. So just south of Midas. Yes. There's actually a historic marker there, right? Uh, it's been moved to our police. Police. Yep. Yep. It's in the front of the police department? It's not there. Oh, yeah, I see it. Okay. Okay. And you've got a developer interested in this? We do. What kinds of businesses could go there? Uh, in, let's see, car washes, auto car sales, hotels. Basically anything in GC, which is our heaviest I've got it right commercial. Here. Yeah. Banks, banquet halls, bus passenger stations, commercial kennels, restaurants, pet stores, bed and breakfast, funeral homes, restaurants, shopping centers, vet hospitals, outdoor sales. Anything. Just about <laughs> anything outside of industrial uses. And there's one homeowner over there? There is a subdivision to the northeast, or southeast, I'm sorry. Um, but there, there's already businesses along Saginaw Street that front Saginaw that these that the houses back up to. Midas is right next door. Correct. They were all notified, planning commission meeting. 300 feet notice, standard issue. At public hearing. Yes. Thursday, yep. Well, a motion would be in order if somebody wishes to make. I make a motion. Okay. Uh, Mr. Motion by Fike. Supported <coughs> by Miss Hugo. Miss Hugo. All right, very good. Trustee Raritan. Yes. Trustee Hugo. Yes. Trustee White. Yes. Trustee Fike. Yes. Myself. Yes. Supervisor Bennett. Yes. Six nothing. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item D, the uh, board will consider resolution 22-1 to approve uh, a 5K walk run race on Pagels Drive for the Grand Blank Band Boosters from 8.30 a.m. to 10 a.m. on May 22nd, 2022. Um, I'm not sure who I'll make the motion. On that. I don't really require any. You want to make the motion, David? Okay, supported I'll make the by motion. Trustee Fike. Supported by Fike. So in your packet, you had some information. Chief well, the, Wiles, I believe, wait, let's see. No, I guess that's not from him. No. Um, I oh, that? It was in there. Yeah, it's in here, but I don't know if this, did this come through? Resolution came no. after. It was an email. No, they, um, <laughs> Mr. Supervisor, if I may. I took the phone call from the band booster that wanted, that needed the resolution. I obviously referred it to, to uh, Melissa, and they drafted the resolution. It's necessary to satisfy the county, as I understand it. And they're getting resol a similar resolution from the city. Okay. As you know, Pagels, there's a very small portion of Pagels that is actually within the township boundaries. 
the lion's share of it is in the city. Yeah. So right. this is <clears throat> very routine, beyond yeah. description. Well, just is it not? Chief, any thoughts on this? I mean, so you are you are correct. It is routine. We get these requests quite frequently. Um, but however, from a public safety standpoint, I'd be curious what they are expecting from road closures or if they need to close the road, um, because if they do that. Um, in the past, we have not been approving those because the onus comes on the police department or the township to provide traffic control. Right. So is this a matter of negotiation uh, well, with, with the, who's ever doing this? Yeah, typically, I think. We I, know, I know in the past, they've always come through the police department, the request, so we can talk to the person, see what, what they need, how we can help them if we can. Right. Um, but the, the resolution... Um, from this board and the road commission is certainly part of that process. Um, just this particular event, I don't know anything about it. But can we pass this with the caveat? They've got to meet with the chief to see about the traffic and if it's a Who expense the that they'll pay for it. <laughs> is there a plan other than just closing the street from 8.30 to 10 or anything else that we receive from them? Or? I, uh, I just took the phone call and referred yeah. it to the... And, and the, the yeah superintendent's what office is, and is very able i am uh, i'm happy to call them and have a conversation with them and i don't know when they when was the event till may seconds. it's the 22nd yes. of may so Maybe we can bring it back to the board there's plenty of time i'd rather have you check yeah, it out first and then bring it back yeah thank you mm -hmm. uh, if that's possible i would prefer to do that mm -hmm. okay maybe yeah. you can work with your uh, counterparts in the city since the lion's share of bagels is in the city and not the town. I know, and the city has a whole other process outside of what we do to authorize road closures. Why does this not surprise me? <laughs> <laughs> well, because we're part of the road commission. Right, they, they control their own streets in the city, so. Streets, so. Okay. so if the board doesn't mind if we table this right now, <clears throat> and we'll ask uh, Chief Wiles to... Okay, bring it back. It. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, you can share the contact information with Chief Wiles and... Okay. All right. Moving on, uh, future agenda items. I think we have a couple of items already for our agenda for the next meeting, unless somebody had something else they wanted us to consider. Okay. Uh, board reports. Ms. Hugo, anything with the planning? Our next meeting is February 3rd. Okay. Mr. White, anything with zoning? The third straight month, there will not be a ZBA meeting. Okay. Everybody's fitting in within our current ordinances, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you that or they're not coming through us. <laughs> Nobody's putting the fences up in January either. <laughs> Mr. Fike, anything on Metro Alliance? No report this month. Okay. So far. Mr. Meriden? The police, I, I believe, offered three uh, letters conditional offers of employment so I think they were accepted <clears throat> okay. fabulous so that's about it okay so clerk Robertson those are three three positions that are being filled three in? positions will be filled probably not until mid June May ish Academy. I have nothing to report mr. supervisor okay a um, couple of things. One is uh, with regard to uh, the garbage pickup this past week, um, we uh, did receive word from uh, Amtera uh, midday on Tuesday of last week that they were not going to be able to, or I guess on Wednesday, I'm sorry, Wednesday midday that uh, they weren't going to be able to pick up all of it. Uh, they had 50% of their staff was out with COVID. They even had uh, temporary workers lined up and, and they were out with COVID. So um, they did the best they could to pick everything up. We put it on social media of all forms that uh, individuals should leave it out uh, till the next morning. Uh, I think they started, they must've started at 6.30 or seven o'clock uh, picking it up. And if you recall, last Wednesday and Thursday were bitterly cold. So uh, my hat's off to their employees for uh, being able to pick it up. The other thing is that with the holidays, everybody uh, tends to have considerably more uh, items to set out by the curb. 
Um, one of the news stations did do a story on it that there were people upset. Um, that wasn't my experience, to be honest. I, I didn't receive very many phone calls at all. In fact, uh, the social media that I saw, uh, people were very forgiving and understanding of of the material workers being out in the cold. And um, we tend to think, I think, sometimes that, uh, you know, the non-traditional jobs should be exempt from uh, getting COVID. You know, we only think in terms of hospital staff, uh, restaurant workers, what have you, um, retail workers being in susceptible to COVID. But obviously, uh, people that have some of these le lesser desirable jobs also run into COVID issues. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think we ought to look at uh, how we, we can show some appreciation towards uh, the work that they do. But anyways, they, they did pick it up the next morning and uh, we'll see how things go tomorrow. Hopefully, you know, they're back to work, but who knows, they, they may still be out with, you know, COVID and we wish them the best health wise so they can get back to their uh, work and providing for their families. Uh, with regard to uh, the 911 uh, consortium, there was a board executive committee meeting uh, today at two o'clock <clears throat> for the members that are part of the executive committee of the 911 here in Genesee County. A uh, couple of things are transpiring. One is that uh, at the last 911 meeting, it was brought up that any municipality that, or at least from the attorney of 911, to those municipalities that want to participate in having their own exclusive contract for EMS service in their community, they were going to be asked for a couple of things. One was that the municipality would be required to pass a resolution accepting the, the liability of the uh, providing for an exclusive or exclusivity to one particular provider they would also be required to have another provider, another EMS provider, sign a contract to be their backup or their, um, what do you want to call it? The, uh, it's not backup. Mutual aid. Mutual aid, um, which I would find hard to believe that anybody will provide that for them if they have the exclusive. And also to sign an indemnification um, for other communities that are involved in 911. It's our contention that, or at least mine anyways, and I think many of the board members here agree, that uh, if an exclusive agreement is provided to a community, uh, the concern is that you're no longer going to send the closest ambulance uh, to somebody. You're going to call the one that that community has an exclusive with and would could result in some significant lawsuits, which could fall back onto the consortium and by way of us being part of the consortium, we could be liable. Um, at today's meeting, I asked the attorney if uh, he felt that, because I, I told him I have a difficult time going against uh, you know, a written opinion or a paid, you know, our attorney for any organization going against what their suggestion is. And I asked him if it was still his opinion that this is not the route to go. And uh, he brought up that, you know, He's trying to limit our liability by having the indemnification, by asking the municipality to pass an ordinance or a resolution that states that they'll take on the liability and what have you. So I'm not sure that is a yes, he's in favor of it, but it's not, uh, you know, he's trying to mitigate the losses basically is what he's saying. Um, however, what's happened since then, since uh, all these communities said they wanted to do this was that they said that they needed these resolutions in by February 1st. <clears throat> However, only one municipality, I believe Davison Township, is the only one that submitted anything thus far. I don't, I'm not sure what they've submitted, but they've indicated that they want to move forward with it. Um, other than that, many other municipalities are asking the question, is that February 1st a hard deadline? So I'm not sure how to take that. Um, we have seen various opinions since then that uh, you indemnification, um, some believe that it's not uh, plausible, that it uh, is not going to suffice. Um, we've had discussion here just informally um, that we're very concerned you know, with this situation, but 
uh, right now we're waiting to see what municipalities actually move forward on this, you know, and say they want to uh, to do this, but um, we'll see. Mr. Robertson, the, Clerk the Robertson. The attor attorney's response to your question and, your, and the way you've related it doesn't inspire a lot of confidence. Frankly. <laughs> right. Uh, well, the, if, it's that, if, it, if it's that close of a legal question, I don't know that uh, I, I, it, it doesn't make me reassured. Well, I, I sent to uh, Mr. Laddie. And that's not a criticism of the attorney, but it's, yeah. but it's just, boy, I don't know. I, I did send one of the opinions to uh, Mr. Laddie just right before the meeting that uh, another municipality had. Um, yeah, the, the attorney uh, and Chief Wiles was there as well. If I'm missing something, Chief, feel free to speak but uh, it was also brought up that um, I believe the attorney said he didn't believe that the liability could go from the consortium to the municipality well I'm not sure <laughs> I want to have our own attorney look at that question but uh, <laughs> well and, and, and the one thing that's certain is the attorney's opinions are flying around and, and for good reason, because this is a, this is a tricky issue of the law. This, comes, this has come out periodically throughout the years. And one of the difficulties, um, and, and Mr. Mayor, Supervisor Bennett can certainly explain this better than I, but there are, so, there are uh, 31 members of the consortium, all with different interests. And so now we're, we're coming into the problem of, of some, some need certain services, some, some uh, do not. And, and from Grand Lake Township's perspective, Anything that we can see that that is a, a derivation from the, the clear responsibility of 911 as far as dispatching goes is uh, concerning for us because we don't want to we don't want to find ourselves on the on the on the losing end of, of some lawsuit and then have um, the the aggrieved parties come to us for the greatest share uh, of the recovery and and the way that it's set up is is that's the case and so. From Grand Lake Township's perspective, we're, we're lucky to have Supervisor Bennett um, being very watchful on this topic and, and knowledgeable about it, and we haven't heard the end of it. And so you'll, um, I'll, I'll be happy to um, provide some insight, at least from our legal perspective, um, to let you consider some things. But uh, it's, it's a dynamic situation, and, and it's, it's, got, it, it's causing concerns all over the county. One of the things that... It's, it's, I don't know that um, everybody on the consortium sees it this way, but um, you know, I'm on the consortium board by virtue of being the township supervisor here, and pretty much everybody that serves on that is there by virtue of the office they hold. Either they're the mayor or they're on the county commission or they're, you know, sheriff. Um, <coughs> well, when you go to the consortium meeting, um, you should be putting a different hat on, which is basically the hat of being a board member for the, the consortium, and not necessarily for your township. I know it's kind of a different concept that a lot of us are not used to, but when you go to that meeting, it'd be great to say, hey, I'm here to vote, you know, based totally on my municipality. Well, keep your experience in mind of your municipality, but I believe when you're there, you're supposed to be voting for the good of of the consortium, but I'm not sure that happens uh, given the outcome of this. But uh, that's something to keep in mind too when all of us are representing the township at various groups outside of here is uh, it's kind of a tricky little twist on things, but it uh, really is true, I believe. Yes, Mr. Fike. When does that consortium vote on this? It was a couple of meetings ago. I, I, I actually need to look that up and I can share that with everybody um, because I want to see exactly who voted in favor of it and who voted against because um, I want to have some conversation. They've already voted on it. Uh, they voted a while back, but it was to basically um, move forward but not to enforce the exclusive part of it. But in the last meeting or so, um, they had a vote that said, yes, we want to move forward. Um, and find out what the steps are to make that happen and, and do it legally, I guess. Um, so it, it's kind of been slowly progressing or inching along. But there was a vote to move that direction originally, 
several months months ago, and I will find out uh, when that occurred, and I can let you know. I realize there's a lot of diplomacy going on here and a lot of negotiations. Fine. <laughs> but as far as I'm concerned, it should be a hard no. I don't think it's, it's yeah. a no-brainer, you know? Well, the, the, you know, the, um, I didn't want to go to the meeting making any threats or anything like this. Um, you know, and then also, you know, talking to Chief Wiles and uh, Mr. Lehmada, Mr. Reardon, there is considerable cost involved if we uh, go this route, you know, and uh, because there's a lot of equipment, computers, things of this nature that uh, we would have to acquire. So it's not, un you know, it's not Fenton even. does it. Yeah. I mean, but uh, we're a little bit bigger situation than Fenton. So um, it's something I, I told them today that we're considering all our options. Mm -hmm. But uh, there wasn't a whole lot of people at the meeting, though, today either. But it's kind of crazy in that something this critical uh, that they voted in favor of isn't, uh, it would be something that I would be at every meeting or have somebody at it. Mm -hmm. So, yes, so I, I would be in favor. I, so, so we don't make a, a false or just bravado bluff right. that maybe Chief Wiles or... The executive assistant, Melissa Roberts. Melissa. Uh, I mean, research some of these costs, so so we know. You know we'll know within the next month, month and a half. I, I mean, I'm even thinking that we could take uh, Patrick's money. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, three point eight million. <laughs> yeah. mm. No, but I, it, it, seriously though, it, it, we should get a handle on those costs, yes. so we know. So if this does come to pass, then we can say we're... Right. I think we also need to take a look at what the revenues are too um, in terms of what the percentage is that uh, the current 911 consortium gets uh, receives from the surcharge because I, I got to believe it's pretty substantial. Um, there is a formula that, you know, if the surcharge were to disappear, what the cost would be for each municipality and ours was staggering. I, I think I can get you the, the breakdown of the, of the distribution of the funds, mm -hmm. at least from two years ago. Okay. Are they aware that if we walk away, the consortium will kind of fall apart? Um, I'm not sure if they are. Uh, and, and is that the case in your opinion? Um, I believe that it would definitely hurt it uh, substantially. I, from what I understand, uh, somebody was telling me that Grand Blank was, uh, Township was actually the holdout uh, for a long time of joining the consortium. I don't know, Mr. Laddie, maybe you know more. Yeah, it, it, and, and I've been reviewing the history of, I have the benefit of, of reviewing a lot of the files that are right. in my office. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, that, that's actually true. We were a holdout. And, the, and, and one of the things that's very interesting and I need to I need to confirm this is we were always kind of recognized as, as a possible separate um, dispatch center, and I think there's some of that language that still exists in the county's approved plan, where Grand Lake Township may decide to be a PSAP in the future. And so that that you're right, we were we were not initially uh, one of the one of the founding uh, participants, and. And have always had this idea that perhaps there's a there's a better avenue for us. There there's some hurdles too, you know, that uh, we would have to overcome. I think uh, Chief Wiles would tell you there's a tower concern that you know the towers that use for communication um, are not ours, so you either have to pay for those or build your own. Um, the equipment issue, um, while I would argue that. Part of the equipment that we have now is ours because obviously we paid into that. It's just like you know the separation of parks and rec or fire. We we own part of we paid for part of that equipment, so I I believe we should get some of it. But at least they're in our possession. Right, they're in our possession. <laughs> Whether or not they would work, I don't know. But uh, so there there's a lot to be considered. Uh, you know, it's it would definitely be a, a expense to our general fund. Uh, which I know Mr. Lima to, it has that un, just an unbelievable ability to find money, so I'm not really worried about that. Have I mentioned that there's no money <laughs> for that? 
So there are a lot of things to consider, but uh, I think it's worth exploring and, and knowing the answers, as you said, Mr. Reardon, that uh, we know the answers to those questions because they're comes pushed, comes to shove, we, we may need to go down that route. February 1st is... They're not holding to that deadline, I don't believe, Chief Wiles, that February 1st. It sounds like that's going to come and go, but uh, I don't know. We'll see. The municipalities aren't racing to the table that originally said they wanted to go this route. So I guess I didn't get a definitive answer on whether the February 1st was hard and fast, but... Uh, right. So the idea is that the reason for the deadline is because the software is being upgraded and it's a major overhaul of the system at 911 and also of all the local municipalities that tie into it. And they need to know how to program, <clears throat> program that software so that the uh, municipalities have an exclusive agreement that that shows up on their computer system. And so they wanna know how do we program this thing starting February 1st? Yes, Mr. Lady. Is, is that element, of, that the software update is for a, a, another aspect of dispatch and this would be in addition to that and that's why they want to have it all streamlined? Is that? Yeah, it's it's all part of, you know, the CAD system. What else is it, Chief Wiles? I don't know. Here, come on up. And, well, and, and I think my question is the timeline's being driven by their need to update their software for other reasons. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So typically in a, in a dispatch center, there's there's several different software components. There's CAD, which is the, the call taking system. When a call comes in, you enter that information. And there's RMS or records management system, which uh, police departments use to write their reports and store their files. There's uh, emergency medical dispatch software to do the, the medical portion of it. So all those things have to come together. And, and right now, the Genesee County, as, as you know, is in the middle of a transition from CAD and RMS systems to get everyone in the county on the same system. So that'll play a role in certainly how they, they program that going forward as we're in the configuration process of that right now. So the February date was, hey, we, we're trying to program this new software and we need to know how to program it, whether there's gonna be some municipalities or exclusive, we need to program that into it. And so that was the, the reason for the deadline, I believe. Yeah, yeah. I, and I just wanted to say that, and I think you probably agree, if they stay with the system currently constructed where they dispatch the closest ambulance, that we would be in favor of staying with 911. Wouldn't, I mean. I right, think so. Issue, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's their current system. That's how they currently operate. Yeah, I mean, and as the police chief, you would be in favor of staying with that as well, right? Oh, for sure. I mean, if someone, there's a call for help, you want to get there, someone there as fast as, as possible. Mm -hmm. The concern is the liability of changing it. You know, our concern is the liability that we may encounter if there's changes made to say that, no, don't go with the closest one, go with the one that has the exclusive agreement. Right, and, and my, my, my point is, is that it, it, we, we're more than happy to stay and be community members if it's not gonna be detrimental. So one of the things that was brought up today that I was unaware of, and I think Chief Wiles was unaware of as well, was that uh, you know one of the things they had requested is that if a municipality is going to sign an exclusive agreement, that they find another organization, another EMS service that would sign up as being their backup or their, um, I got a mental block. Mutual aid. Mutual aid, yeah, mutual mutual aid. aid partner. Well, if, if Dave's company has the exclusive for a community, why do I want to provide backup for his exclusivity? It just helps him to beat me out of business. So what they came up with is that, um, I'm not sure somebody had a meeting with the state or what have you, and they, what they heard, and I've heard it disputed since, was that uh, that because they're licensed by the state, those EMS providers, that they're required to respond to another community, even if that community has an exclusivity, that they're required to provide backup, unless they go to the state and request to have their license restricted so that that community is not part of their license. So in other words, if Davison chooses to have an exclusivity with one particular provider, the other ambulance companies could go to the state and say, look, we don't want Davison included in our contract to provide ambulance service for Davison Township. In that case, all the others would be excluded, and now just that one ambulance service 
would be providing EMS services to Davidson Township. That's basically what I heard today, right? So that was something new today, and I'm sure it's going to be explored because there's some that well, question I, I, whether or not that's the case. It's clear that we need to let this issue evolve a little bit further before we can make mm -hmm. any oh, yeah. decisions on it, and that's yeah. that seems to be the best course of action. Right. Let's see what February 1st brings. Yeah, but I want to make sure the board, you know, is brought along along the way so that if something develops quickly, I'm not having to let you know all of it at once. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at right now, and we'll see how things evolve, as, as Clerk Robertson says. Okay. So, all right, anything else? Okay. Um, the other thing is uh, <clears throat> uh, well, yeah. we do have several new businesses that want to move here, so... Um, you know, what's amazing is every week we get a new phone call from somebody that comes in that wants to uh, be here, which is great. So I think we've had two this week that um, I know I've met with just interested in talking to Jeremy about where they can locate here. So that's great. Uh, Attorney Laddie, anything to report? No, sir. Okay. Mr. Lemina? One item for housekeeping. We're going to have to uh, decide... Uh, when the mosquito millage renewal question is going to go on the ballot. If you wanted to do it in the May election, um, then we, uh, the date for the cutoff was uh, January 25th to get that language approved by the board and sent in. Um, that would not be my recommendation, however. I, I would prefer that we did it in, uh, you could do it in August or November. I think August is more appropriate. You want people to vote on, on the mosquito millage in August, when uh, mosquitoes are oh. out there, <laughs> makes sense. Well, uh, and also at this particular moment, we I do not know that there are any other issues for the May ballot. So if we can, yeah. we bet we've budgeted for the May for the May election, but if we can avoid it by a lack of items, uh, then more the better to do August rather than rather than May. Yes. Yes. It's making me itch just think about it, but. <laughs> Okay, motions in order then. Uh, Ms. Hugo adjourn. Ms. Hugo, uh, well, I guess we don't need a vote necessarily on that right now, but we'll we'll take it up. Okay. In August, I guess. So. No, I mean. There's I, a consensus that August to will work. Adjourn at 9:02 p.m. There's a consensus that we want to do it in oh, yeah. August. No, I was seconding. I didn't. I thought. Correct. Oh, consensus okay. for that. But okay. I agree with okay. you. Okay. All right. So we'll do it in August. August. Okay. Um, and, but that else? doesn't. I mean, okay, that that's not a vote of, voted item. Okay. I thought I was making a motion to adjourn. <laughs> okay. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nine o two p.m. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.